Well, last week we began a series we're calling Building Strong Families, and we, in this series, we are examining the Ten Commandments, and, and, and I want you to understand, our goal is to help each one of you build a strong, healthy life, and our goal is to help you build strong, healthy families, and to build strong, healthy families, we have to build strong, healthy men, strong, healthy women, strong, healthy children as well. And this series, Building Strong Families, is a series that applies to you no matter what stage of life you're in. If you're, if you're married and have kids, this, se- this series applies to you. If you're single, this series applies to you. If you're a student, this series applies to you. Everyone, I want you to understand, just because it's Building Strong Families, it doesn't exclude you, but it includes you and applies to your life. Everyone needs to understand the principles for building a strong family. Each one of us, we must have a biblical understanding of family values. We have to have a biblical understanding. If we don't, we are confused and we are led astray. Last week, we examined commandment number one, which is found in Exodus 20, verse 30, where the Lord said, you must not have any other gods but me. And notice it's a little g. We talked about little g gods, things we put in place of God. And God says, I am the Lord God and I want to be first. In fact, um, there's a great scripture that I read in my, in my quiet time this week. And it's, it's uh, Isaiah 42, verse eight. He said, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. God is very serious that he is God, and there is no other God but him, and he wants to be first in our life. And the principle we discovered last week is put God first. And if you remember, I I told you, if you were here, I told you any area of your life that you want God to bless, put him first in that area, and he'll bless it. No matter what it is, put him first, and he'll bless it. Today we're going to look at the second commandment. The second commandment deals with how we worship. And we're going to discover that this second commandment will help us build a strong, healthy life and help us have a strong, healthy family. And if you read these two commandments together, commandment number one and number two, you'll notice real quick, they are very closely related. In fact, they're so closely related, it's almost like God is saying the same thing. In verse three, he said, have no other God but me. In verse four, he says, don't worship anything but me. Have no idols. And so God is, he's paying special attention. Out of 10 commandments, the first two, he's talking about putting himself first. I thought it was kind of interesting last week. I'm always watching your faces and connecting during our time in the Word, and there were a lot of mad people last week, and I was like, well, I'm just telling you what God told me to tell you, and I just thought I'd pause and tell you now. If you were mad last week, you're going to be mad this week too because I'm just going to tell you what God told me to tell you, and God is serious about putting him first. He is not playing around with this, and here's why. We were made to worship something. We're made to worship something I went online and, and just kind of Googled and looked up what's the simplest non-religious definition of worship, and, and this is what I found. It's in three parts. Worship is extravagant respect or admiration for or devotion to an object of esteem. Worship is to regard with ardent or adoring esteem or devotion. And then the third one, worship is the reverent love and devotion accorded to a deity, an idol, or a sacred object. Here's what I know. We are all worshipers. We worship many things regularly. We're all worshipers. And there are people today that you worship different things, you worship different places, you worship different people. Some worship their job. Some worship their car or their money or their possessions. Some worship their education. Some worship sports or music or celebrities. I can go on and on and on with examples of what we worship. We worship so many things. In fact, some of you, you'll say, well, I worship God because I'm in church, but can I tell you, just because you're in church doesn't mean you're giving your worship to God. Just because you're here, all that tells me is you took time out of your schedule, out of your day, to come and to to have a worship experience and, and try to honor God, but that doesn't tell me that you really worship God in your life. It tells me in this moment you took a moment to do that. So let me ask you this. What do you love the most? What holds the most value in your life? What do you love the most? See, the object of our greatest affection and admiration will be the filter we view life through. So whatever you decide you love the most, that's how you're gonna see life. I grabbed a, I grabbed a gel that goes on the stage lights, and, and if I look through life with this gel, can you tell what color the gel is? It's red. And so if I walk around with this, I'm like, y'all, y'all look kind of red today. Did y'all get a lot of sun this week? Why are y'all so red? And like, Pastor, you're an idiot. Yeah, I know, I'll be an idiot for Jesus all day. I don't care. I just preach them the way God gives them to me. If I, if I spend all week walking with this gel and I put it close to my eyes and I'm like, oh, y'all are really red now? And I spend all week walking around, everything's gonna appear red to me, right? It gets real simple, right? 
This is the filter through which I will view life. Whatever you value the most, that's the filter through which you view life. So if you value your job the most, everything is viewed around your job. If you value your possessions the most, everything's around your possessions. What do you love the most? What do you value or cherish the most? If you'll be honest, there are some your answer is me. Me. I value me the most. I am the most important person in my life. And if that's you, if that's what you're saying, what I want you to understand is you're making yourself a God, a little G God. And if you make yourself a God, that will affect the way you see the world and the way you relate to people in the world. There are many filters in our life. The, the main filter of our life should be God. It should be his word. It should be his presence. But there are many other filters we look through our eyes and see the world through. We look through the world through, with power. Some use control. Some use sex or pornography. Some use money. Some use possessions. Some use people. We look at the world through these filters. But the Bible teaches us that God should be our filter. And when God is our filter, when his presence is our filter, our worldview is radically changed. Did you know the presence of God was never intended to only be experienced for an hour on Sunday morning? The presence of God is meant for us to live there and to dwell there and to experience his presence all the time. Now, if we're the kind of people who live in the presence of God and dwell in the presence of God and experience his presence all the time, don't you think living and dwelling in God's presence will affect how we relate to people around us? Absolutely it will. You should not be in the presence of God. Oh, God, you're so great. You're so holy. Oh, you stupid jerk, get out of my way. You can't go from worshiping and giving God honor and calling somebody a name. But we do it all the time. Why do we do that? Because we say our filter's God, but really our filter's me. What's gonna make me convenient? God has to be our filter. He has to be first. That's why I love where Jesus taught in Matthew 6, and he said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. You know what Jesus is teaching us here? The kingdom of God comes fully equipped. If we'll put God first, if we'll make God our filter, if we'll make God our lens, we don't have to worry about anything because he said, you put me first, you seek me first, and I will take care of everything you need. And the problem is we're like, well, God, I need a Lamborghini and a Hummer, and God's like, no, you don't. That Toyota's gonna work just fine. Well, God, I need to win the lottery and be a millionaire. He's like, no, you don't. You don't honor me with what you have. Lord, I'll bless you with more. Sorry, that was free. That just kind of popped out. But it's true. When we keep God in front of us, that will affect the way we live. When we keep God's presence in front of us, that will affect um, the kind of man or woman we are. That will affect the kind of spouse we are. That will affect how we talk to our children. That will affect the kind of employee we are at work. When we put God first. So, is God really first in your life? Proverbs 3, 1 through 6 is an amazing passage of scripture. Solomon says this in verse 1. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Verse four, he says, then you will find favor with both God and people and you will earn a good reputation. And I love verse five and six. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. If God's first in your life, you're seeking his will in all you do. You know what that means to me? When I start my day, I should start by saying, God, you're first. What do I need to do today? How do you start your day? What what happens when you wake up and when you get out of bed? What's the first thing you do? And, And sadly, a lot of people, it's like, let me see what's going on in the world today. This is not the way to start your day. This is the way to start your day. And actually, before we get here, You should start your day here. God, I bow before you. I make you first. God, today I want you to be my filter and I want to see the world through your eyes and help me to be the man that you want me to be today. Lead me, guide me, and direct me by your word, by your presence, and by your spirit. And ask God to intervene in your life. And let me tell you, you start your day out on your knees and move into the word, you're going to have a great day. Even if everything falls apart, 
You know what's amazing? Is starting your day on your knees in prayer, starting your day in the word of God, it doesn't matter what happens that day because you are now equipped and prepared to keep God first. We, we sing a song, what did it say? Raise a hallelujah in the middle of the storm. Can I tell you, if you haven't spent time on your knees and time in the word and a storm comes today, you're probably not saying hallelujah, you're probably saying, oh God, help me. But when we put him first, we're prepared. Does it make sense? You understand? So listen. Anything I put before God is an idol. We are made to worship. And anything I put before God is an idol. I read it to you already, but Isaiah 42, 8. I love this. He said, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else nor share my praise with carved idols. God is very serious about being the object of our praise, the object of our worship. He wants to be first. He says several times in the scripture, I am the Lord. I read it this morning a few chapters over. He said, I am the Lord and there is no other God. We're like, well, but there might be this one God. He goes, no, he's not a God. I am the only God. Exodus 20, verse four and six is our text. Listen to what scripture says. The Lord said in verse four, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. This second commandment teaches us two things. It teaches us we shouldn't make an idol out of anything, and we should only worship God. Let's talk about those two. First of all, don't make anything an idol. What's an idol? An idol is anything that takes focus away from God in your life. Anything that takes the focus off of God and puts it on something else, that's an idol. When anything is first in my life that's not God, it's an idol, even if it's a good thing. Do you hear me? Anything, even a good thing that I put before God is an idol. Anything I put before God becomes an idol. To idolatize, to, I can't even say that word, to, to idolize that, to idolize something means this. It means we add value to something and make it more valuable than God. And again, I have some examples, that, and this might not be your example, there are many, I just listed a few. There are people, and on the surface we would say, no, nobody does this, but we do. There are people who make their car or their boat more valuable than God. There are people who make their money more valuable than God. There are people who make their kids more valuable than God or sports or the league they're in. There are people who make a style of worship or traditions more important than God. We can go on and on and on. Don't make anything more important than God. Archaeologists tell us that in every culture throughout history, there have been idols. There have been statues, little gods and little goddesses. As human beings, we have this innate desire to worship something. And because of this innate desire to worship something, people are all the time turning inanimate objects into things of worship. We're made to worship. You say, I don't know if I believe that, Pastor. I don't care if you believe it or not. It's true. The Bible teaches us. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon said that God put eternity in the hearts of all humanity. So we were formed and made knowing there's someone greater, and his name is Jehovah. His name is God, and we are made to worship something. So God teaches us we should not idolize anything. There are three reasons God tells us not to idolize things. First of all, idols will disappoint you. See, an idol will always promise more than it can deliver. Let's uh, try and think here. How do I not step on toes too bad? Let's talk about cars. My car's my idol. What happens when that car gets caught in a hailstorm? What happens when that car gets deemed at the grocery store? What happens when that car, somebody bumps into it with their cheaper, obeter car? You're disappointed because your things you worship is now losing value. See, anytime we put a person or thing in the place of God, we're gonna be disappointed. Listen to what Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 10, 14. He said, the whole human race is foolish and has no knowledge. The craftsmen are disgraced by the idols they make for their carefully shaped works are a fraud. These idols have no breath or power. Listen, anytime you put a person or a thing in place of God, anytime you expect one person or one thing to solve all your problems and guarantee your happiness, you will be disappointed. 
If you're idle, like, if I could just get this job, this better job where I'm making all this money and working all these hours and I'm just going to be happy and be set, you will be disappointed by your idol. Idols always disappoint you. The second thing, idols will dominate you. 1 Corinthians 12, too, the Apostle Paul writes and he says, you know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along and worshiping speechless idols. So there are two inevitable things that happen when you worship something other than God. First of all, the thing you worship more than God will begin to influence you. A better way we can say this, another word we could use is addiction. It will control you. What controls your life? And anytime I have these conversations with people and they tell me something's controlling them, I'm like, that's an addiction. Oh, I'm not addicted. I can quit any time. Really quit. Let me see you quit. Oh, well, I can't because I've, I've got used to it. Anything you put before God begins to dominate your life. When you worship something more than God, eventually that thing will run your life. Secondly, Anything you make an idol will lead you astray. When we worship things other than God, we begin to lose our perspective. When something takes place of God in our life where God should occupy that place. Think about this. How many people, by the lure of a promotion, were led to neglect their family at a crucial time in their kids' lives because, hey, it's a promotion and we can make more money and we can have better vacations and we can have better stuff and we can be set up for retirement. And how many people, for the lure of that promotion, traded crucial time with their kids for something in the future? It's not always better. How many people for the promise of fame compromise their integrity? Listen, integrity is who are you and nobody's looking. And can I tell you, I've I've read through the scripture many times and I yet have not found the verse that says God wants me to be famous. But you know what I keep finding throughout scripture is God wants me to be faithful. He never called anybody to be famous but he calls all of us to be faithful. And my purpose in life, my whole goal in life is not to be famous, not to be well-known. My purpose is to live in such a way to be the husband I'm supposed to be, the father I'm supposed to be, the man I'm supposed to be, the pastor I'm supposed to be, so that when I step into eternity, I can hear God look at me and he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you a responsibility and you were faithful to what I asked you to do. God's not going to ask me how many people we had in church Sunday. He already knows. He's not going to ask me how great the offering was. He's not going to ask me how many degrees I had or didn't have. He's going to ask me, were you faithful with what I called you to do? Were you faithful in honoring my son? See, God tells us if we don't watch out, an idol, anything that we worship more than him will distract us and cause us to lose our values and will begin to dominate our life. So God clearly says, don't make an idol out of anything. The next thing he said in this commandment is to worship him only. We're to worship God only. Worship means giving my highest love and devotion to something. Only God deserves my highest loyalty. Only God. There's no other human alive that deserves more loyalty than God does in my life. Only God deserves that loyalty. There's no person, there's no career, there's not a thing that desires that. Only God does. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 1.25. He said, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise, Amen. If we don't worship God only, we are trading what God intended to worship. We're trading the truth of God for a lie. We're worshiping created things rather than the creator. God is the creator. He's the object of our worship. There are three benefits to worshiping God only. First of all, worshiping God brings me fulfillment. See, when we put God first, when we worship him first, the Bible teaches us that we will experience fulfillment in our lives. Look what the psalmist said, Psalm 37, verse 4. He said, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We, we, like, we like this verse, right? I've heard people, I've heard well-meaning people say, well, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. Read the first part of the verse. Take delight in the Lord. You know what it means to take delight in? It means he is my greatest admonition. He is my greatest thing that I admire. He is my value. He's the one I'm pursuing. I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to honor God. All my loyalty is his, and I take delight in him, and nothing else fulfills me. Nothing else satisfies me that, but God. And when we're at that place, we're that kind of person, then God says, I'll give you the desires of your heart. But we want God to give us the desires of our heart, but we don't want to put him first. It doesn't work that way. Romans 10, verse 11, the Living Bible I love how the Living Bible read, uh, translated this verse. It says, Paul said, for the scriptures tell us that no one who believes in Christ will ever be disappointed. Isn't that amazing? You put your hope in Jesus, you will not be disappointed. 
You make God the object of your worship. You put him first and worship him above everything else and you will never be disappointed. I've never met anybody who honored God above everything else and came back and said, well, I was disappointed. Life let me down. You're never gonna be disappointed putting God first. Don't settle for an image of God. He's the real thing. I was trying to think of some examples and um, I didn't bring anything, but I come up with a couple of things. I was thinking this week, what's not quite as good as the original? And really anything, right? I mean, anything is. But the first thing that popped in my mind, I know you're gonna laugh at me, but it's just, this is how my mind works. I was like, what's not quite as good as the original? And I said, you know what? Hydrox cookies are not as good as Oreos. You ever had the generic Oreos? They don't quite taste the same. The cookie tastes a little different. The cream filling, it's just not the same. There's nothing like original Oreos. Like, you understand that? How many of you would raise your hand and tell me, I love Dr. Pepper? Any Dr. Pepper lovers? So what if you Dr. Pepper lovers, what if I told you after service, I bought you some Dr. Thunder? Are you excited? No, because it's not quite the same. That's what this verse tells me, that when we put our hope in Jesus, we will never be disappointed. We don't need to worship something else and settle for an image. We need to worship and honor the real thing, and he brings satisfaction to our life. He brings fulfillment. The second benefit to worshiping only God is is worshiping God frees me. John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You want to be free? Put God first. Well, Pastor, but what is truth? Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In John 14, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. This is the truth. Who determined this is the truth? God did. That's that's a benefit of being God. You get to determine what's truth. He's like, well, I don't know if that's true. Hold on, if you're saying this isn't true, you just made yourself a God, and you're saying you know better than Jehovah God who what his truth is, and you don't know what truth is. He knows what truth is. Yeah, but, you know, the Bible's an old ancient book, and I'm not sure all those biblical principles still apply in the 21st century. Oh, they apply very well, because that's the thing about truth. When God established truth, he wasn't mistaken, he wasn't confused, and he did not change his mind. And when we put him first and we honor him in his word from the front page to the back page, we are free. Jesus went on in John 8, verse 36, and said, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Listen, when I put God first in my life, when I put God first in my family, it sets me free. I no longer have to worry about the approval of others. Somebody said one time, I think it was Dr. Sam Chan, He said, what other people think of you is none of your business. I wrote that down. I was like, that's good. And I've caught myself worrying about what you think about me. And every time I worry about what you think about me, the Holy Spirit goes, forget it. It's none of your business. But Lord, and he's like, are you here to please them or please me? I'm here to please him. When I don't worry about your approval, I am free to be the man God called me to be. See, putting God first is relaxing because when I put God first, I am no longer responsible to meet your expectations. I'm only responsible to meet his expectations. That make sense? When I put God first, I am free from my past. How many have a past? A couple hands. The rest of y'all just, let me tell you, you have a past. You know what I've learned? The enemy loves to throw our past back up on our face. He loves to go, I thought you were a Christian. And when he does, just say, shut up, devil. I am a Christian. I'm just not perfect. I'm forgiven. Yeah. Well, I thought Jesus set you free. He did set me free. My flesh just hasn't let go of this stuff yet, and I need the Holy Spirit to bring more freedom into my life. The enemy loves to throw your past back up in your face, but when you put God first in your life, you're free from your past. You know why? Paul wrote and said, if anyone be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So when I give my heart to Jesus and I put God as first place in my heart, I delight in him. He has the throne of my heart. He gets all my worship. He's first in all that past. I'm a new person. I'm not the same guy I was before. See, your past is who you were before Christ transformed you. Your present's who you are now. And there may be people who knew you back when. Just tell them, I ain't the same person I was back then. I gave my heart to Jesus, and I've been set free. The third thing, the third benefit to worshiping God only is, is I needed another F word. So worshiping God will finish me. 
He fulfills us, he frees us, and he finishes us. It's a pastor thing. We love these alliteration things. But what I wanted to say was it completes me. You heard people say that, oh, Mr. Wright is so wonderful, he completes me. Or Mrs. Wright, she's just the most amazing wife, she completes me. Listen, no human being was ever meant to complete you. Only God is meant to complete you. Only God is meant to fulfill you. And putting God first develops me and my potential to be the unique person he intended for me to be in the first place. God has a unique plan for your life. He wants you to be the unique person he created you to be. God doesn't want you to be like me or the person on your right or your left. God wants you to be the unique person he created you to be. And you will only become that person by putting him first. Because now you're fulfilled, you're free, and then he can finish what he started. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 115.8, those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. You know what he's saying? You become like what you love. I want to become like Jesus, not about anybody else. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, he says, for the Lord is the spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Look at verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is the spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. You become like what you love. Whatever you love, Whatever you worship, you become like that. You worship money, you become materialistic. Oh, pastor, I'm not materialistic. Give all your money away. Oh, well, no, I can't do that. Why not? It's got a hold on you. You worship yourself, you become more selfish. Oh, I'm not selfish. Serve somebody. Oh, I don't have time to serve. Yeah, you're selfish. But if you worship Christ, you put Christ first, you become like him. You know what I love about putting Christ first and, and being on the journey to become like Christ? We're never gonna make it until we stand in his presence. We're always a work in progress. Because what I've learned is I, I spend time in the word and I'm like, oh God, thank you, you're teaching me to be like who you want me to be. And he goes, yeah, but look at this verse. And I'm like, oh, oh Lord, that's, that's, we gotta work on that. And he works in parts of my life and he makes me more like Christ. And when I'm like, oh, I'm so good, I'm just like Christ, he goes, no, sit down, hold on, turn the page. Let me show you this one now. We're always a work in progress, becoming more and more like Christ. And God will complete what he started in our life. Now listen, you cannot become all God wants you to become. Your family cannot become all God wants your family to become unless you put God first. You cannot put God first and trade his glory for idols. Romans 1.21, Paul says this. He says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-loving God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. You know what God's saying in his word? If you worship anything but him, you're a fool. Oh, pastor, you're interpreting that wrong. Look, friends, verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. His scripture is very clear. We put him first or we're being foolish. God is very serious about who we worship and he is the object of our worship. Now, before we go, allow me to quickly point out two additional reasons to worship God only. Back to our text, Exodus 20, verse four. He said, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. Look at verse five. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Verse six, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey me my commands. Here's something I've learned. Idolatry is the most punished sin in the Bible. When people were idolatrous, God didn't play games. God is very serious about his people not making and worshiping idols. God's not playing around. And, and, and the warnings that are in scripture still apply to us today. Look at verse five. He said, you must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of, par of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. This is a strong warning that we have to get our worship of God right. 
We can't play games. We can't play around and be half-hearted. We have to get our worship right. The influence of false worship and idolatry is passed down, Scripture said, from generation to generation. Now, please understand. Your personal walk with the Lord, it's not just about you. It affects your entire family. My walk with the Lord affects my wife. It affects my children. It affects my grandchildren. And in the years down the road when I have great-grandchildren, my walk with the Lord will affect them. How I treat the Lord is going to impact my family. I wonder how many parents have passed on their own scattered impressions of God down from generation to generation instead of passing down the truth of God's word. So here in verse five, when God talks about punishing the children for the sins of the parents, he's not talking about children inheriting the guilt of their parents' sins. He's talking about children inheriting the consequences of the sin. You see, unconfessed sin brings consequences that affect me and my children and my grandchildren and future generations. I don't want to be the kind of man that half-heartedly worships God and lives in the consequences of sin and pass that on down to my children. I want to be the kind of man that truly honors God and passes the blessings down to my children. And that's the, that's the last benefit in verse six. He said, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Notice verse five taught us that God's punishment affects the third and fourth generation, but right in the next verse, in verse six, he says my unfailing love reaches thousands of generations. Let me help you with the math. Thousands is greater than three or four. We can, we, can, we can make something an idol and we can not give God first place and it will impact three or four generations in a bad way, in a negative way. There will be consequences to our actions. Or we can put God first and honor God and thousands of generations behind us will be influenced by our walk with the Lord. See, verse six shows us that God delights in showing mercy. In fact, Micah 7, 18, the scripture says, where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. You will show us your faithfulness and unfailing love as you promised to our ancestors Abraham and Jacob long ago. God loves to lavish his love on us. God loves to be kind and merciful and full of grace. True love for God will always result in obedience to God and his word. But you know what? We can never offer God perfect obedience. Not one of us are perfect. That's why Jesus had to come die for our sins. And that's why God looks at our heart. Do you long to be the kind of person that obeys God? Do you seek him to obey him? Do you, do, you, do you regularly confess your disobedience as sin and ask God to forgive you and be merciful and gracious to you? As we conclude this morning, I want to leave you with a question. Really, it's two questions. It's one. What are you storing up for your children? What are you storing up for your children? The consequences of sin or the mercies of God? What are you storing up? What you're, what you're storing up is determined by the object of your worship. Is God first or are there idols in your life? Whom or what is the object of your greatest affection? Would you bow your heads? Let's pray today. God, I thank you today for your faithfulness. I thank you for your amazing, unfailing love, your mercies and your grace. You're so full of mercy, so full of kindness. And God, thank you for Thank you for the direction you give us through your word that you created us with a desire to worship and, and you created us to, to worship you. And you've shown us in these first two commandments where to put you first and worship nothing else but you. God, maybe there are some here this morning that the truth is they, they on the surface, they say they worship God, but in reality, they're making other things idols. They're, they're, they're trading the goodness and the mercies of God for something that's not quite as good as the original. Holy Spirit, stir us this morning to bring us to a place of repentance that we could say, you know, you know what, no longer, but from this moment on, I don't want to store up the consequences of sin for my children and grandchildren. I want to store up the blessings and the mercies of God. So from this moment on, God, I'm going to put you first, and I'm going to make the changes I need to make to honor you every moment of my life, every moment of every day. God, thank you for your faithfulness. I ask you to bless each one and stretch us today stir us today and change us today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church, and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.